people that I started out using heroin with, shooting with, um, I can call off maybe five names. None of them are alive right now. Three of them I know died from AIDS. There was eight of us in my family and there's only three left. And four of them died from this disease. I, I was like devastated because I had my sister die from the virus. Out of everyone I knew back then that was doing drugs uh, along with me, they are all dead. It, it came to a point where I said I needed to stop going to funerals, you know. Our government is allowing thousands of young men, young, especially young black and Hispanic men, to get HIV disease, transmit it to their families, and die because they are saying that if we give clean needles, that we are saying that we support drug use. Well, if they're saying we don't want to say we support drug use, but it's all right to say that we support death. <laughs> Straight out the South Bronx. No doubt. Drowning in rivers of contaminated syringes. Visions of death under my head. Yo, how we living? AIDS transmitted the baby from woman and man. Informing the land that something's wrong with the government. Won't lift the band. So they leaving my people's damn to die in the streets. Not on the corner of St. Anne's. The evidence speaks. If we don't reach the next time we flex, all our peeps will be left with no breath. But if you build it, they will come. And if they feel it, maybe disease won't be spread by the use of drugs. Where's the love? We need more than just praying. Now's the time you know, you know what, what I'm, I'm saying. saying. Word, my mind. Can't you see what's going on in my mind? I be going, yes, yes, y'all in my mind. I can hear my people's call in my mind. In many states, including New York, it is illegal to purchase syringes without a prescription, and it is illegal to possess syringes. People who use drugs, who inject drugs, do not have access to sterile equipment. They have to share syringes. All of those are most probably dirty and infected. In those states that prohibit over-the-counter sale of syringes, not coincidentally, those states have the highest rates of HIV transmission. Since 1987, injecting drug use has been the primary route of transmission for HIV. 220,000 Americans have died as a result of no access to sterile syringes. These include active injecting drug users, their partners, and their children. I don't understand why people keep on buying this illusion of control. When you say, uh, you know, just, just don't do it, that, act, that people will stop using drugs. In the harm reduction approach to drug users, what you do is you say, okay, you are using drugs, so you better do it in a safe and responsible way. Legal exchange is a harm reduction scheme. It does not make any judgments about drugs just recognizes that people use drugs and can use it safely. Needle exchange programs provide active injectors with sterile syringes in exchange for used syringes. To give free needles, morally it's wrong, uh, ethically it's wrong, and scientifically it does not achieve the purpose for which you said it would uh, uh, achieve. Uh, you are not sure that the addict is going to use this needle the way you want him to use it. You are not sure that this is going to have an impact on the IV drug user plus the AIDS. What's up, Tommy? I started off as a volunteer in the South Bronx five and a half years ago. I, I've been here ever since. documentary, you know, it's not... I stopped counting the amount of people that I know that have passed away. Okay, how many years you been using, Pike? Uh, 25 years. 25 years? Okay. About how many times a day? At least seven times a day. Seven times a day? Okay.
Okay. Um, are you on a methadone program? No, I used to be. What happened? Why did? Uh, when was the last time you was in a methadone program? Well, I got like I got locked up, so uh, I had to detox while I was in there, and I did a year. So they detox you they from the methadone? They from the methadone program, yeah. And they didn't give you a referral to go back to any treatment program no, after that? No, they didn't, no. No, the opening racket's out, they just throw you out, that's it. You know, they they'll give you anything. They just throw you out? Yeah, that's it. When you finish, you're out of there. We give them a bleach kit. It has water, bleach, a bottle cap, matches, alcohol pads, and a band-aid. Also, the instructions on how to clean them. I mean, yo, you're surviving. You're still, you know, you're not, you have a lot of strength, bro. You know, it ain't easy. Just know that. Nosotros estamos ahí, you know. <laughs> All right, tranquilo. If you use hay, that's their attitude. You deserve it. You should die. I, mean, I, I can elaborate on that for, uh, for hours, you know, whether or not it should be our responsibility to take care of them once, once they choose to live that, that lifestyle and they get the AIDS. Uh, it, it, you know, the question should be asked, uh, are, we, are we our brother's keeper? In the South Bronx, where I come from, the HIV epidemic was not distant from us. It was right here in front of our face. It was in our families. It was shameful to see the indifference, the result of public policy in this community, and to hear the smug revelations from politicians that this was somehow the fault of these people. The story of syringe exchange is the story of activists like myself who decided to bring good public health policy back to our communities. We launched the St. Anne's Corner of Harm Reduction in a small little community park on St. Anne's Avenue. I used to see Joyce like the mailman, that the mailman goes on, the rain, the snow, no matter what. Joyce was out there trying to help her people. She used to give them condoms, needle exchange, and advice. There was a heady period. We were out there for about um, close to three years out in the cold. In fact, we're still out there. But in our third year, we got a home, a home with uh, walls and a window, no furniture, but it was our first home. What you see is basically the morality of altruism, the morality of self-sacrifice that's creating what we see around you. You know, no one basically, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we should give out needles. At whose expense? Blank out, you know. Whether you agree with it or not, you, whatever you make, the money, your, 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 the fruits of your labor is being given to individuals to shoot up drugs. We just wrap enough condoms, give out to the kids outside, make sure we keep the neighborhood safe and clean. No one wants to talk about safer sex in our schools, in our community. What? What's the problem? So you say that the government is broke, <laughs> so why not do something that's cost effective? What does it cost? to treat a person with full-blown AIDS, you know, over a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand dollars. That's just in medical care. What does it cost to give someone a syringe? They think handing out syringes is going to say that you condone what's being done. And they don't realize that a person that's been shooting drugs and having bad sex over a period of years, you can't just change that in one day. Being locked up, I've seen five individuals yeah. share one set of works, knowing that one person was affected. In prison, they don't give out no needles. I tell you, I know that um, that me personally, I mean, this this whole HIV thing has, has, has taken a toll in my life, you know. And I was thinking about my friend, Willie, not only he died of the virus, but he all also ended up dying in prison, you know. And my friend wasn't a, a, a criminal. He was a drug user. I mean, I'm a former user too, you know, and um, fuck, man. Um, to think that, that the only reason why my friend is not here today is because he didn't have access to a, a, a sterile syringe, you know. It, it, you know, that's a, that, that's a fucking crime. Children are dying from it. Old people are dying from it because it, it doesn't discriminate, you know? And, and, you know, seeing my sister die the way she did in a hospital convinced me that I had to get in and do something to fight this deadly disease because sitting down and crying in my house was not going to help people. I mean, come what on. What was that? Drugs been in our society for, for uh, Sigmund Freud sniffed cocaine. 
asked while doing his studies, and if it was back then and it's still here, well, what's that telling you? I had just gone clean. I never in my life had a job, and I was like 30-something years old, never had a job in my life. Okay. I volunteered for several weeks, and I remember Joyce coming up to me and telling me, I like the way you work. I'm going to put you on, on my staff. And I was like so blown away because I said, my God, this woman actually wants my input on something. You know, and I was so excited. And I was like, and then I, after the staff meeting, I told her, and she told me, everyone here is important. It was really overwhelming. We're not here to implement drug use. We're not telling people to use drugs. We're telling them if you are, do it safely because you don't have to die because you want to shoot up a bag of dope. You know what the crazy thing about a drug addict is? Because we all think we're infallible. A person will go and look for the same drug knowing that it's killed a hundred people because they say in their mind they were greedy. That's why. They overdid it, you know? They tried to take too much of it. Not that it was poison or how bad it was, you know, or that it, it killed so many people so all of them couldn't have been greedy like that. I was lucky also. I never um, overdosed. You know, I, I, I have a fear of needles. You know, I'm a drug addict for 20 years, and I have a fear of needles. You know, I'm one of them guys that be patting and... <laughs> You know, and I, and I gotta close my eyes and maybe have someone else hit me, you know. It, it, needles, I have a paranoia of needles. I used to only smoke crack, but, you know, I found out that, you know, I couldn't just do crack because, you know, I like, I'm quiet and I'm real paranoid and I can't have nobody around me and stuff like that. And um, it was like real depressing. So I started doing heroin, so the heroin like will bring me back up and, you know, I can conversate, I can listen to the radio, I can look out the window and stuff like that. But, um, you're not ready, you know what I'm saying? It's got to come out of you. You know what I'm saying? Your mother, your daughter, your family, your friends, no one can make you stop but yourself. Now they've been to a I tried and tried, but you know, it's like they keep giving me the runarounds, you know, proper ID and this and that, and, you know. This place that I'm calling is called Yonkers. Okay, it's, uh, they'll pick you up, you know, and they'll assign like a, uh, a counselor to you. And what they'll do is before you let go, like they'll keep you there for two days without no methadone, you know, they'll right. detox you for like four days, five days. And then the last two days, they'll just just call observation. They just want to make sure you're okay. I mean, I tried kicking on my own, but it's, it's too hard, man. It's too hard. I can't do that shit, you know? You know? Then I got kids, you know? I, can't, I couldn't even make it through the first day by myself. So I started screaming at my kids, you know? That's like... We're going to take it out on my kids, man, you know? And I got four that, you know, when you're kicking, you don't want to hit shit, you know? So you're not even working, right? Nah. You're not working? Nah. So it must be, I mean, like, it must be a bitch having to get 30, 40 bucks every day. You know what I'm saying? You know, and it's like, to tell the truth, the way I get my money, I go into supermarkets and... And boost. And boost. I guess you know how to survive. Yeah, but I can't, I can't keep on, man, you know? I can't. I'm running out of supermarkets. <laughs> well, not just that, but you know, I wanna me coming out. Man. Yeah, you know, I wanna, I wanna be clean already, man. I wanna stop this shit, man. It's been, it's going on five years now. Hi, everyone. This is Eddie from Sanias Corner of Harm Reduction. Um, I have a male participant. It's great that the people that we send into drug treatment programs, each and every one of them, would remain abstinent from drugs. But the reality is that out of 10 people that you send into a drug treatment program, one will make it. The rest, well, they're back out there using again. So the point of harm reduction is, what do you do with the remaining nine? Good luck. Thank you. 
It happened to the best of us. I relapsed. So plenty of people relapsed after being clean in time for a long time because the addiction is what a disease. Oh shit! The cops are here. Yeah. Yep, let them know they just want to come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. No, yes, no, yes. Come in. 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 The police, all they're doing is like using us because they know that we have a disease. So it's easy for them to catch somebody doing drugs or copying drugs and really, you know, really fighting crime, like trying to catch the, the big time drug dealer or trying to catch. Uh, rapists or something like that. It's a major difference with the philosophical framework that we have now with the present administration that are that is basically, I, I think, pro-police, pro-law enforcement, pro-law and order, letting cops be cops. They are unshackling us and allowing us to do our, our job. We got a thing we do now. Tell them when the police come over here, we zip, we, we unzip yeah, our we coats. Yeah, we unzip our, hey, look. Hey, look, we, right, we don't have, have nothing. nothing. I was on my way here for volunteering services and what happened, I was um, stopped by the police. Hey, what is your complaint? That we're doing our job? Go. No, no, we I'm asking them, you know, what's going on here? And they say, well, there's a sweep for um, all drug dealers. I said, but you don't know him. He just came on the block. They just made the assumption that I fit the description of an individual that they felt that could have been a drug dealer or whatever they wanted to call me so and they was incorrect as almost always <laughs> how many guys you think you are 32 years old brown five foot eight a couple of hundred thousand i guess maybe the whole neighborhood <laughs> you just come ramsack people's door grab search break everything down half the times they don't even find anything in anyone's house have you found anything right now no i'm still looking Still looking? Who are you guys with? Why the Inspector General? That's what it says. Okay. Are people allowed to go into the building or? Not you. Um, you don't live here, right? Can you go? Okay. Can you get out of here now? Sure. Bye. Bye. Is this building under siege? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You live in this No, I live around the corner. How do you feel about How that? How do I feel about it? Yeah. Mad as hell. Mad as hell because I have to put a child on the school bus 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. Missing school buses is unfair. They wouldn't do it in their neighborhood where I come here. It's very unfair to our children. It only happens to the blacks in Puerto Rico. Yes. The cops are starting to yell at us. They're coming and, and pushing They're down right the there. stairs. The cops are right there. Snipers, look at them. Excuse me. Can we ask you a question? Is it okay? Nope. Are those rifles that you guys got in there? No comments. No comments. Give me a badge, and I'll show you how bad I can be, because I'll go into their neighborhoods. I'll harass their sisters, their mothers, no, they their daughters, sisters. their sons. That's right. That's right. Soon as they come out their house, I'll be snatching them up. Why are you coming out here? Every what do you got? They didn't produce a warrant. All they produced was a suspicion. I work, we worked very hard over the last six years to develop trust in this community. So if, if you have the police entering our premises simply on impulse or simply to find out you know, for some other end, they are undermining that trust and undermining my work in this community. Being that I, I come from the need change, otherwise they, I show them my ID, they come and they take it and they break it. You know, they take it and they break it. You know, and that's not right. Because if you got your ID for the needle change, you ain't supposed to come and take it, you know. The officer said, what's that you got, got, got in your mouth? And I said, I don't have nothing in your mouth, right? So when she said, open up your mouth, and she said, oh my God, right? So then she took her finger like that and said, what's this? And took my tooth and pulled it all the way down. And I said, oh my God, what you doing? And she said, oh, I thought you had something in your mouth. The ghettos and the collective depression that you see here is, is a result of, of, of years of decades of drug war and criminalization. The devastating results of that shouldn't be, you know, proof to do more of the same thing and to put more money into prisons and, and doing the same thing, but to start doing the reverse and do something else. Now, the time you know what I'm saying, work, my mind. Can't you see what's going on in my mind? I'll be going, yes.
Take a look at the work that we're doing and take it seriously and not be afraid to make a decision that would save lives. I know this works. I know harm reduction works. I see it every day when I'm out in the street. And that's maybe what our politicians need to do, come and see and be in the grips and be in here in our communities and see how this program is working. There are two parts to uh, the announcement today. The most important part is scientific consensus, that needle exchange programs, when carefully designed, will reduce HIV, particularly for children and for women, and that they will not increase drug use in your community. That's a very important conclusion and consensus. We hope that this certification of the science by the nation's chief public health official will help state and local health departments in their efforts to include needle exchange in their local HIV prevention plan. However, we are gravely concerned that despite the wealth of scientific evidence that the Secretary has certified today, that this administration has chosen the politically easy path and will not actually make federal funds available. This is essentially a political decision? Oh, I, I think that what we've reported today is on the best kind of science, that needle exchange programs carefully designed do in fact work. I'm and talking about the decision, the very specific decision, not to use federal money for needle exchange programs. Is that essentially a political decision? Oh, well, I don't think so. The real issue is will there be more funds for treatment? And that's obviously, we're giving, I'm getting as much money out there as I can, but that's why I think it should remain a local decision and why I made the decision I did and why I'd like to see uh, this controversy put behind us because I think in a way, it, in terms of impact on people, it's been there have been more heat than light on it. The absence of federal funds means that we will continue to struggle to meet the very little need that we can meet at this time. It also means that new programs will not be born because there are no funds to support that endeavor. <laughs> 